you know, 90% of the chief designers of most automotive majors are alumni of Art Center. And I then came back to India, uh, started a, a small electronics uh, un, uh, auto component, uh, sorry, electronic component unit uh, that my father ran. And of course, I didn't know what an ohm and a frequency was, never got interested in that. And I told my wife that I want to really get into car design. And, uh, you know, they were shocked, my parents uh, and my wife, they were shocked uh, because there was no such thing as design, design in 1993, uh, less, uh, of course, car design. I mean, <clears throat> you only had the stable brands of Fiat Ambassadors and Maruti at that point of time. And I kind of uh, convinced uh, my folks at home uh, because I, I communicated to the fact that I had not seen anyone die of hunger, you know. Sure, if the organization fails, I'll come back and take a job somewhere. So I think the essence of, of, of the uh, seed was that you have to be fearless. Uh, of course, all this was possible because one was, uh, you know, um, one had dollops of obsessive passion. When people come to me or when youngsters come to me for, uh, you know, openings, uh, they say we are uh, passionate about A, B, C, and D uh, products, uh, and I really don't take, the, take interest into them because unless you're obsessively passionate about a particular product or a particular uh, subject, you really can't succeed. And I think I had that obsessive passion for cars, anything I ate, slept, drank cars. And of course, uh, you know, being uh, an entrepreneur, you always got to take one step uh, at a time, one step at a time into the future. You got to be relevant. And we went from uh, being auto, manufacturing auto accessories to manufacturing cars because we had to ensure that we get into new segments because you are going to get commoditized in the earlier segments in any case. So, <clears throat> are we supposed to be crazy? And is that a good thing? I think essentially, if you are a creator, you can never be put down because you are creating something. You're not fudging a, a ledger. You're not fudging uh, someone's pocket. You know, you're, you're not robbing Tom to pay Peter. You're creating something. At some point of time, it is going to pay back, definitely for sure. I think in our case, uh, you know, in, in 2003, we made the first breakthrough with the Aston Martin project where we were competing with the Italian design houses. And we succeeded in our first attempt to get an international project and that too of an Aston Martin. And it was not a bread and butter product, as you all know. And how did we do it? Because we actually, um, you know, seeded that idea way back in the, in the year 2000. So we were crazy enough at that point of time where our revenues, in fact, uh, couldn't be justified to take part in the Geneva Motor Show or the Frankfurt Motor Show. We actually took part. Uh, you know, looking back, uh, I really sometimes wonder how, how we had the audacity to really do that. But that, in effect, paid us off in getting us those uh, important uh, breakthroughs. So you've got to be crazy enough to want to believe uh, as if there is no tomorrow. You live for the day. Uh, I'm sure, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, I think uh, Mr. Suta talked about minimizing risk. Uh, I do agree with him at this point of time. But at that point of time, <clears throat> you just want to do it because, you, 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 you know, you're ready to go. And I think that serendipity is what really gets you going. Uh, I think the, the common traits have been the brinkmanship, you know, you might think it's rec reckless, but in this world of, uh, you know, uh, change coming so fast, so often from across the world, uh, when I started out at DC Design, uh, our opportunities were fewer, and therefore our competition also was lesser. Today, uh, the opportunities are far, far higher. You have global opportunities and you have global competition as, as well. So obviously, you've got to ensure that, <clears throat> I think, 
the most important asset that you have is time and it's not money. Uh, <clears throat> you know, many people ask me, uh, why did I become an entrepreneur? Uh, so I was, I was a designer. Uh, designers are usually right-brained people. They usually work in, in the rarefied studios of car companies uh, once they have achieved seniority. Um, they have the bells and whistles. They have private jets to jet around. And why did I come back? to swim in the uncertain waters of uh, entrepreneurship and that to Indian, Indian entrepreneurship. I think essentially the answer was to really uh, control and direct my own destiny. I realized back then that if I really work the better part of my life uh, for, a, for a company, at the end of the day, I was going to build their brand equity. And by the time I retire, I would just be a statistic. And that, that thought was really scary. So uh, how do you really uh, live your dream? So you know, one, one tends to draw, one tends to create hundreds of sketches a week. Uh, across the world, you have car designers uh, who create maybe tens and 20 sketches uh, a day. But it's of no use unless you manifest them into a physicality. So I realized that if I really had to have an enriching future or an enriching livelihood, one that I was enjoying my day, I had to create an organization that was able to transform these sketches into reality. And therefore, uh, I had to create this backend, uh, uh, you know, to be able to actually practice my craft. It was the other way around, actually. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy doing that. I've, I'm, I'm glad I did that because that has given way to me being a designer, to an entrepreneur making custom cars, uh, to being a car manufacturer. As you, some of you might have known that, you know, we are the youngest and the newest car manufacturer with Avanti, India's only supercar. And therefore, I think, Essentially, this is a journey that every entrepreneur could take in India as well. I mean, people are quite shocked uh, that, you know, being a car manufacturer, you need, you need lots of resources, you need lots of, uh, you know, uh, manpower, you need domain knowledge, you need, you need a viable business case. But it all falls into place if you have done the right things. And what are the right things that you do? I think, as Mrs. Suta spoke earlier, you have to create an organization that gives differentiated products and services. For sure, I mean, that's no way, that's no brainer because otherwise you're not gonna have a life left. Why would somebody come to you? So in our case, the differentiator was we did what a manufacturer would not or could not do, either because of skill or because of scale. And that was a place under the sun. So whatever we did, we did or whatever we do was ascribing to that one positioning of the market. So essentially, <clears throat> you know, uh, as, as a creative person, uh, you are able to only, uh, you know, reap as much as, as the output that you can really uh, uh, give out. But if you become an entrepreneur, if you, if you really uh, create an organization which has hundreds of people, then th there's a huge multiplier effect and of course, there's a brand cachet attached to that as well. I think more importantly for me, uh, I had to grow the organization not because I loved growing the organization, not because I, I could boast of a certain revenue, but because that larger revenue gave me the choice to be able to do more daring creative projects, which otherwise I would never, never been able to do. So that's how it actually fed into each other. Uh, finally, I think, <clears throat> you know, um, to really sustain as a creative organization, you need to be uh, one step ahead of doomsday in that sense. So you've got to be able to think out of the box, newer segments, as I said, uh, which a manufacturer will not or cannot do. Uh, one good aspect of a creative organization is that you actually complete a loop and go, go on to the next project. So it's not a continuum in that sense. And therefore you create, you reap, you end, you create, you reap, you end. So in that sense, 
there's a continuous, uh, uh, you know, regeneration, uh, which in our case is three to four months time. You complete the uh, loop, you have the learnings, you go on to your next project, you complete the learnings, you go on to the further next project. I think one of the uh, essence of a creative organization is that if, if, you, if you ran it with passion, you, ha you worked hard, of course, uh, we all know that a good organization that survives is one that actually has a good team. Uh, in, in my case, I'm, I was very fortunate to have an organization that, had, that has no employee turnover. And I've asked myself the question, and in fact, a lot of uh, uh, people ask me, and they're curious, how come we never had this kind of uh, employee turnover? And it's for the simple fact that every day, each one of our uh, uh, employee came to work doing something new on that day, which he never did yesterday. So you had new design, you had new material, you had new processes, you had new customer, and you had, you know, e everything was just about new. So it was a very, very interesting and very exciting day for each one of them. And I think that's one of the reasons why they stayed put. Uh, also, I think, uh, importantly, you got to optimize and go up the value chain. So, for example, we started uh, making uh, custom cars. That, that's how we got there. That's how we got our brand connect to the youth because we were able to give differentiated offerings. But we realized that we need to go up to a much higher value. And therefore, we, uh, you know, as I talked to you, we have really abandon that segment because it's no longer viable for us. So we do buses, we do aircraft interiors and, and things like that. But I think as as a as a organization you've got to keep going up the value chain. You've got to keep optimizing your value per square foot per, per employee. And that's really uh, uh, the way that would give you the kind of returns so that you can invest into new pro programs and new products, more challenging uh, projects, which will actually take you much, much further uh, way down as well. Also, we were, uh, you know, being, being creative, uh, you are able to uh, continuously uh, uh, arouse the curiosity of a customer because you are always creating things into the future. Crea creativity is all about tomorrow, and only tomorrow can excite. It's never yesterday that can excite you. Uh, yeah, also, I think important is to understand the, 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 the founder has to have the humility of letting go. Uh, in my case, uh, um, you know, many times I do feel trapped of creating a beast that I have to feed, but I sit back and then see and, you know, weigh the pros and cons. I think <clears throat> it's important to uh, delegate and it's important to uh, understand and appreciate the fact that there will be people uh, or, or in your organization, team members who are much younger than you, who you have much greater ideas, and they may be more right than you are right. I think you, you mature, and as, as long as you accept those facts, uh, it, it, is, it, is a, uh, it is a fantastic thing because uh, customers are always satisfied. I mean, um, I'll give you an example. In my organization, a peon sometimes comes to me and tells me, that color in that car is not right. It doesn't seem right. And I, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm surprised that he has acquired this sensibility. So how has he acquired this sensibility? Because he's, uh, he's emboldened to be able to come and tell me that something is not right. And when I look into it, and he's right, actually, it's maybe because of my busy schedule, and I've actually overlooked it. So you've got to build a team that is, uh, you know, incentivized to put the points across. Of course, you debate, and you know, the better idea wins. So, do uh, designers make good uh, CEOs or business leaders? Uh, I would think so. Uh, there have been some reports in some of the business press. Um, I think the CEO of the future is going to be a designer because he's able to think multidimensionally. I think designers are able to visualize in 3D. Uh, and that's one of the reasons 
why future leaders are being groomed from the D schools, not necessarily just B schools. Also, the designers uh, being artistic, basically, from where they come from, right-brained, uh, they have somehow the need to endear themselves to their colleagues, to the team members, and I think that empathy makes them better leaders. Uh, this is my belief. Uh, this is what I'm reading um, as I speak to you. And I think the point is because designers love their craft, they actually are able to lead the teams because they need that job so very badly enough. Thank you. Well, yes, ladies and gentlemen, on that note, we're going to just bring the session to putting the clutch to the first gear, and we're going to request the audience to accelerate it forward with some questions as well. So we're going to take two quick questions. I believe we have two questions from the audience right ahead. Can you have the mics right ahead? So I believe you have a question as well, right? So we'll take yours as the next question. Hello. Yeah, uh, very good. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, morning. You've been truly inspirational in terms of what work you have done and uh, to us. My very basic uh, question is, you know, uh, what process do you use in being more creative? It is like lateral thinking, more of more of reverse brainstorming, or what creative processes do you really use? Like you've told about how creativity is more important, but how to get more creative in problem solving and all those things? Well, the processes are uh, age old. <laughs> You start with a sketch, a pen and paper is all you need, but of course you have modern tools. Uh, uh, you know, you have several uh, tools to really enhance that creativity, computers and tablets and things like that. But essentially I think it's the germination of that idea which is very, very important. And I think that's got to do less with creativity and more with marketing. So you must understand what, uh, what are you creating and for whom are you creating? And the answer will come to you, to you that you're creating for a, for a customer. It's probably an unmet need. And therefore, there's a market positioning. So that is dictated by the marketing department. Because at the end of the day, whatever you do has to be viable. You've got to finish the product. You've got to earn that profit, put it back into the bank, and invest it to create a next product. That's how you grow the brand. So it's a, it's a, it's a combination of marketing and uh, creativity. It starts with marketing positioning. Uh, I would think most car makers today, if, if some are floundering and some are really doing well, it's not about the design. It's about the product planning division, which has probably thought five years, eight years ahead, what that product needs to be in that segment. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Tushar. Yeah. Uh, from last three sessions, we've been talking about creativity innovations, sure. uh, which is revolving around that. And yes, definitely it is needed. Sure. When Colgate started, it started with a small opening. And a creativity which came in picture is like a big opening, made the sales uh, tenfold uh, bigger. And the same uh, came with an innovation, aapke paste mein namak hai and then Sensodyne. So it was a revolution which made. But isn't uh, it that there's a thin line between unethical and ethical uh, creativity or innovation? And it's becoming a pressure on entrepreneurs to be uh, creative all the time. Because there's some uh, situations where you can't be creative. Uh, rightly said by you that the marketing makes a lot of difference. So how can we tackle as young entrepreneurs when customers or the, uh, the uh, investors are looking for only innovations and creativity in a business? Is that the mandatory thing which people are looking at? You see, you have to, I mean, within the constraint that you, that you described, uh, if you are intensely focused and if you're obsessively passionate, uh, you will come up uh, with a differentiator. That's for sure. I'll give you an example. When I, uh, you know, of course, in, in the car business, uh, we have a lot of opportunities where we were able to dis differentiate very well because, as I said, our position was what a manufacturer will not do or cannot do, and that was very easy to, you know, spot even today. When I did art, it was a three foot by five foot canvas. And I was, you know, uh, 
frightened that after my first few uh, canvases, because I, that was the canvas I had, three foot by five foot, flat piece of canvas. What would I do? And you'll be shocked that it opened such big avenues that there was no end to it. Now, why was that? Because I needed to do something differentiated. I wanted to leave my mark as a man. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to go home having earned some money on that day. So I think these are the driving points. Uh, I must mention here that uh, one of the trade-offs of being a creative entrepreneur is a work-life balance. And I think I made that compromise with my family. I said, look, if you want a great quality of life, I have to keep working almost 18, 20 hours. So for today, I mean, uh, if I am invited to a party, I actually resent that invitation because that is robbing me of something that I love doing. What is that? What is what I love doing? I love creating. So I think if you get into that mode, you are automatically going to get innovations. Nobody is going to drive you. Not even investors are going to drive you. And that's how progress has been made across the world. I mean, Steve Jobs, he, he never invented any of these things, but he perfected it. So how did he perfect it? Because if you remember, his buzzwords are, he wanted insanely great products. His buzzwords were think different. So if you have insanely great products, if you think differently, you're going to get there. Thank you so much, sir. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can we have a huge round of applause once again? And I'm going to request Ms. Ritu Maria to please come on stage and uh, present a token of gratitude to Mr. Dariq Chabria. A very enlightening session indeed. And uh, we'll take that enthusiasm and uh, that ideas forward as well with our next keynote session. Thank you once again. Well, ladies and gentlemen, before we get started with our next session, um, what we're going to be doing is also requesting you all to keep those tweets coming using uh, Entrepreneur IND. You can hashtag or you can even follow us on our official handle. That is Entrepreneur IND. So all that you get to hear from our speakers, all that you get to witness here in, in the summit, keep those tweets coming and let's get to also share it with the world outside what we are getting to witness here. Um, I'm going to get a quick heads up from my team if we are good to get started with our next session. Once that happens, once I get a thumbs up from our team, we'll get started with our next session. Meanwhile, keep those tweets coming as well. <laughs> 